the way. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for, for, for having me, folks. Um, I've got to say I'm so excited um, about the response. Um, I guess a real quick um, snapshot of me. Um, I'm a chef uh, since the um, start of my training in 1985. Went to Europe and learned a lot um, about uh, the marvellous cuisines of Europe and um, spent a few years working in London um, at the Savoy Hotel in Switzerland and Austria. Loved all that um, and loved travelling and I love the way the Europeans embraced um, a cuisine and, and their, their culture. And I thought back then there's nothing like that in Australia. We don't have a true Australian cuisine. So that's what really got me on this path of trying to investigate Australian native foods. So I really got into it in 1985 when I came back um, as a chef and um, a chef at Mount Lofty House in the Adelaide Hills and started getting into native foods and it's been my life's mission and project since then. So um, um, I've been out of the restaurant game for 20 years now, running Creative Native Food Service in Adelaide. So we are one of the longest running uh, Australian native food, uh, I guess, distributors. And um, it's been my great joy in more recent years to uh, start to engage more and more since I've been away from the 14, uh, 15 hour days at the stove cooking in restaurants. Um, I've been able to uh, start to engage more and more in the last 20 years with Indigenous people, uh, which is really, uh, really exciting. So um, this has sort of culminated to um, uh, really sort of looking uh, the way Australian, Australian cuisine is changing in the last 10, 15 years um, and uh, seeing um, how, how the, the rise in, in interest in native foods uh, has really become exponential, I guess, in the, in, in the last four or five years at least. And, um, and yet uh, still, um, I think we're a long way off from having a true Australian cuisine. So I sort of thought to myself, well, um, how are we going to really influence the cuisine uh, in Australia? And um, we have to really start with the young and educating the young. And that's what's led me to trying to develop some resources for uh, you guys on the front line, home economics teachers into schools. Because um, I, I really believe that uh, a few few serious points, we have to engage more and more with Indigenous people um, in, in the, the commercialisation of these uh, amazing Australian native ingredients. And secondly, we um, really need to um, uh, work on, on getting these foods used in the home because to me, um, a true cuisine is, is comes from the heart and the home. And um, it's what people cook at home and, and what they grow in their gardens and all those sorts of things. So we've got a hell of a long way to really uh, I think, uh, and, and it'll take many generations um, to really get a true Australian cuisine style. We have a, a fantastic multicultural um, uh, style of cooking now with all the ethnic um, influences in the last you know, 100 years or so uh, into Australia. So we have a very free spirit in terms of trying all these different cuisines and styles. But um, it's only just recently that we're starting to incorporate native ingredients into those more red Andrew, have you unmuted your button? Something happened there. Did, did, did I lose you guys for a while? Yes, you did, but you're back. Good. Where did, what did we miss? I wasn't aware I was on mute there. Sorry, I must have touched the mouse or something. I don't know what I missed, but it was very short. <laughs> oh, very good. So um, just just coming to, to um, the fact that we... Uh, we, we won't have a true Australian cuisine until we get more and more people using Australian native ingredients in their home in the generations ahead. So the best place to start, is, I thought, was is in the schools and, and uh, talking to the young. Um, so that's why we're here with you guys. And um, um, so we decided last year to develop a, a bit of a uh, – try and get some resources together to help – uh, home ec teachers all around Australia to get into native foods quite easily. And so here's, I guess, a bit of a snapshot of, of what we've done. Um, we're, we're selling some of these uh, education kits online already, creating native foods, of course. And so I just wanted to take you through that, uh, what um, what's involved with the kit. And um, so we're just trying to make it easy as possible. Um, and so let's just flip through these pages, I guess. So... Um, uh, there's just a, a few slides here with some of the, the different things. Of course, there's me, the, the, the owner, and we're based in Adelaide. Uh, we've got a lovely little warehouse and, and shop front in Hindmarsh. 
If you know Adelaide, um, it's very close to the entertainment centre. It's only uh, five to ten minutes from the very centre of the city. So you're always welcome to um, pop in here if you're in town. Um, so the kit, uh, basically, we decided to look at getting uh, five easy uh, dry spices that we could whip out in the post really quickly and easily. Uh, each one is um, about a um, uh, 30 to 40 gram or 50 gram uh, spice and uh, they all fit into a nice little sachet uh, uh, envelope. And um, so the idea is that we uh, can get these uh, when they're ordered out to you very quickly so you can straight away start to incorporate them into uh, lessons quite easily. Did quite a bit of work um, um, uh, interacting with a couple of uh, fantastic home ec teachers here in South Australia. Um, Linda Allwright from Emanuel College and um, Amanda Johnson from um, um, Mental Blank. I'll think of that one. Anyway, um, wonderful help. Um, and uh, we've sort of devised a bit of um, uh, a lesson plan and some homework plans. Um, and uh, we also decided to do uh, five fact sheets. So there's some uh, factual information that um, the teachers can download these resources and uh, use them for handouts for the kids. Um, then also uh, we did uh, some posters. So um, yeah, I'll just sort of run you through those. Um, so the main uh, key ingredients, I tried to pick um, species that were A, well known and, and B, uh, also uh, obviously that would transport easily, um, C, that would have great flavor impact, uh, they would therefore be cost effective because we know you guys are um, more than often than not on a very tight budget. Uh, and of course, easy to use. So I'll just, um, just go through some of these things. I mean, um, and yeah, I guess it's a really good, really good phrase that we, um, we you know, the, there's so many um, boxes that can be ticked by embracing Australian native cuisine. And, and that's, I guess, one of the reasons why it's starting to become quite a, um, um, a top of mind uh, subject and um, a hot topic because, um, you know, boy, even uh, with Jock Zonfrillo um, uh, and MasterChef this uh, past year, uh, it's been um, very heavily promoted. So it's, it's really starting to gain some momentum. And um, whereas back when I started in, 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 in the um, 90s, it was, it was quite a fad, a new thing with the Red Acre restaurant. I opened in Guja Street in Adelaide in 92. We had an amazing run of uh, great years there. And I finally got out of the restaurants in 2001. But, um, you know, uh, I really do think the future of our Australian food industry with cl climate change and, 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 and better engagement with Indigenous people, better use of land, and that, uh, the future of our industry is really in the outback. And um, we just need to help the kids find it, really, and um, embrace all those, those wonderful um, attributes. Um, so there's the five species. We've got old man saltbush, um, which is a very hardy, arid zone plant. We've got uh, native pepper leaf, which is very much a cold climate, um, sort of a cooler climate plant. Uh, plant. Um, it grows right up into the snow lines, even into the highlands of Victoria and, and the heaps in Tassie as well. Uh, there is a form of uh, native pepper called dorigo pepper that goes right up into uh, the, the um, uh, mountains in northern New South Wales as well, and uh, more subtropical native pepper. Uh, in, in the high country there. Of course, lemon myrtle, uh, which is a, a magnificent rainforest or subtropical rainforest tree from the East Coast, uh, very well known. Uh, wattle seed, of course, um, and many, many of you teachers may, may not know, but there's uh, many, many edible species of acacias or wattle seed. Uh, and the native food industry has pretty much for the last um, 30 odd years really only traded one, which is Acacia Victoria. But um, uh, when you sort of research it a bit, you can clearly find that there's, uh, well, I think it's up to 70 species are recorded uh, as being uh, eaten by Aboriginal people um, in terms of the seed. Uh, and an interesting one too is that even uh, uh, some, some of them uh, flash fried the, um, the, the bean because the wattle seed is a legume, a bean. So they flash fry the, the green um, pods um, in their shell steam, uh, just in the, in the hot ash and fire to uh, steam them open and enjoy the um, some of the species uh, as tiny little uh, like a green pea which is quite interesting but mostly they're sold dried uh, of course um, harvested at the end of end of summer um, but um, I now trade up to 15 species um, of acacias because they all 
such uh, there's such great diversity uh, in, in flavour and size and, and appearance, um, uh, and I think there's an enormous um, potential for uh, wattle seeds as, as, a, as just one one of um, many many native foods. Um, and you'd be very interested to know um, I'm working on R and D right now with um, a malting house to malt um, uh, with different wattle seeds uh, because you know uh, they're lovely as a sprout of course they're a viable edible seed the whole seed um, and um, they sprout and of course then you can malt them like a barley or oats as you would for, for brewing um, but it, what it does is transform um, a, a rock hard little tiny seed which survives for 20 or 30 years in the desert and it'll break your teeth if you eat it raw it transforms um, that um, that grain into a once it's malted and then toasted to a light medium or dark caramel malt you get a lovely crunchy whole crisp which can be quite dark uh, and coffee like flavor or a light nutty grain fan so that's some interesting things that are, are coming your way in the future in terms of the whole malted seeds uh, and different model seeds you can see those going into muesli bars and um, cereal mixes and brewing and gins and um, all sorts of whiskies and stuff in the future um, so exciting space that and the last one there is wild basil. Um, an interesting one, this one, um, this is Ossium teneflorum, which is also known as holy basil because it's actually endemic to Southeast Asia as well as Australia. And uh, we know it's um, been here for many, many, many hundreds of years because the early uh, records of um, the uh, explorers uh, uh, penetrating into Northern Territory uh, found um, the holy basil there, wild basil growing, and um, it was um, had a, a number of Aboriginal names through different communities in the top end there. So who knows how long uh, it, it's taken, um, or it might have been here for 60,000 years, so I don't think we'll ever know. Um, so there's those five species. Of course, the wattle seed, back to that one, is roasted and ground. Um, it is not the malted wattle seed. I was just elaborating a little bit on that one because I'm quite excited about that. Um, yeah, so uh, the next thing we've got here is some fact sheets. Um, so we've done a bit of a fact sheet and I really would love uh, when you guys have a look at this online or uh, we get this information out to you, uh, whether we've gone over the top with um, nutritional values and stuff. I guess we uh, we set out at first to target year seven and eights. Um, we want get, to get to the youngest uh, when they first get a chance to actually cook something in school. And um, so uh, maybe that's too much information, um, but uh, would love your feedback when you see these fact sheets. So we've done a fact sheet for each species, which gives um, a bit of, of the uses, the seasonality and so on, and a bit of nutritional information. <clears throat> I'd be curious to, to find out, you know, what you teachers think about, um, uh, you know, is, is that too early for them to be worrying about nutrition or the true nutritional values? I think, of course, it's very important to <clears throat> teach good, <clears throat> excuse me, good nutritional practices. <clears throat> um, then we've sort of gone into um, a bit of a lesson plan. Um, there's there's um, a number of pages on that. And um, I guess one of the things um, I wanted to highlight to you, uh, you, you may or may not know that um, Bruce Pascoe, who's a marvellous um, uh, Aboriginal man who's written the, the book Dark Emi, Black Seed, and has also now, I think, worked on a, a children's um, book and I believe he's also working on um, um, a TV series as well. But he has some ABC educational videos online. So I'll put some links on there. And they do uh, have some fantastic references, I think, to the Australian native foods in that. I think the kids would really be interested in that historical context. Um, we hope so, at least, yeah. So there's uh, obviously some lesson plans there for you to, um, uh, I guess, follow if you choose. Um, Again, feedback on any of this in the future would be gratefully received. Uh, we thought we'd try and do something lovely and colourful um, that you can uh, blow up and um, uh, print. I believe um, most uh, most schools you can print uh, a colour in. Is it, is it um, a, a uh, five posters? Or I'm not quite sure, but um, even if it is only A4, you might want to blow up some nice colourful posters with a bit of information on that. That's one in the wild basil. Um, and so there's five of those posters at this point in time. Um, and then we've gone through a bit of, about the, the assignment. Um, so we give the kids a bit of a challenge, but um, uh, hopefully one of the objectives too would be to get um, them cooking at home with more native foods. Um, and um, 
that would involve mum and dad buying uh, ingredients in the future too. So we're hopeful that will have an impact um, to get more native foods being um, uh, bought by, by the home. Um, I'm looking at some sort of measures to try and um, work with um, maybe Australia Post. Um, uh, it could be one outlet uh, as, as they have many, many shops around Australia. But, uh, or it could be um, a supermarket chain in the future where we try and get some of these uh, dry spices available for um, general consumers. There's a little bit around, of course, there's quite a bit online all over the country. There's some marvelous uh, websites selling native ingredients. Um, and so there's no, yeah, there's no real challenge. If you get online, you can find a lot of these ingredients. <clears throat> um, but I'm certainly proud that we have, I think by far the greatest range. Um, you'd be interested to know too, teachers as well, that um, uh, we're the only a website I think I know, or the only one in Australia where we actually break down um, uh, a lot of the frozen native ingredients. So if you have a look at creative native foods online, um, you'll see we do things like 100 grams of dates and plums, or you know, um, ribberries when they're in season, or um, uh, frozen kwangdongs, or um, you know, we have um, native tamarind, satin ash, all, all sorts of uh, amazing lemon aspen um, things like that. So. Um, uh, we're the only web website, I think, that, that does that at this point in time and break down what normally is only available in bulk bags, you know, kilo or two kilo bags for chefs uh, in the hospitality sector. Uh, now we have a, a retail outlet for that. So you may want to dabble in that sort of thing um, in the future. Um, uh, the other thing I'd, I'd comment too uh, about is in terms of um, our ingredients. We've done all these in, in small status type little retail packs. Uh, another big bonus is that we've chosen to go with a, um, a compostable bag, which I'm sure you'd be pleased. Um, what it doesn't afford, though, at this point in time is a window that you can see the product. Um, but uh, at least we uh, show that online as well. Um, but uh, I think um, you know, our aim is to try and avoid the single use plastics where we can. Um, so, you know, look, back to the assignment, of course, we want to challenge the kids to be cooking some of these ingredients at home and, and recent, doing a lot of research and getting a great assignment together on Australian native cuisine. And it's um, all the positive um, uh, possible impacts uh, on our environment, on the way we uh, view horticulture, how it connects with indigenous culture, uh, all those positives as was sort of um, alluded to before. Um, the recipes now, I... Uh, uh, I've been a little bit slack uh, and I've got to do a lot more hard work on getting more recipes online. I've only got a, a handful, but um, uh, I do want to, um, uh, we're starting to um, uh, write a little bit in, in the HEA newsletter. I think the first one just went out recently. Um, is that, that right, Robert? Uh, that was only a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? And um, I think the next one's coming up. Well, my aim is to try and get a, a new recipe in each HEA newsletter, but of course we'll build that resource more and more. Um, so what we've done is um, uh, try to obviously just scale the recipes for uh, really to be really simple. Um, I believe we, we're aiming for inside a 40 minute, 40 uh, minute type uh, sector to um, cook and prepare and cook. Um, I hope that's uh, in line with what you guys do or want. Uh, and we're looking at recipes that was sort of um, uh, about uh, just a small scale recipe for two people. Uh, again, I'm, that's what I'm, I understand is what you need, but uh, again, looking for feedback always. Um, the beauty is with a lot of these uh, spices I mentioned, they're, they're quite strong and intense, so a little bit goes a long way. Um, uh, in the case of most, most of them, I think are 50 gram um, uh, sachets that we have in the kit. And um, so with a teaspoon being between two and three grams, um, you're looking to get you know, upward of eight to 10 recipes out of one, one sachet. Um, 50 gram sachet. Um, the uh, wild basil is a, a very light and dry herb, so that's that we can't fit as much in the same size sachet. And of course, because it's light, um, uh, a little bit goes a long way too. So um, uh, that's only, I can't remember, I think that's about, um, oh, what's right here? I've got one here. Yeah, that's um, 30 grams, that one. So um, yeah, we uh, you should get pretty good yield, you know, out of these. Um, uh, Cost-wise, I, I believe, um, and I hope that's the case. Um, yeah, look, uh, so I think that was just a bit of a snippet from the, the newsletter that went out. So uh, I hope you do, uh, everyone, have a look at um, that newsletter. And, um, and uh, yeah, I guess it's time to uh, give you a little bit of an update. Um, I've um, 
I've got a new cookbook out, so I would love you all to look at um, potentially getting one of those for your school libraries. We have hard cover and soft cover, so a bit of a plug there, but um, very proud of the, the book. Um, I'm getting some great raps um, from people in the trade and um, other wonderful chefs like Stephanie Alexander, who's a, a longtime friend, who thinks it's marvellous. So I'm really, really proud of it. Um, and um, we're on to our first uh, reprint is underway now, um, even after three months. I think we opened, we launched uh, early June, and so we're ordering a new reprint already, so that's exciting. Um, yeah, loads of recipes and ideas there. Um, I, um, a few other things. I, well, I mentioned Stephanie Alexander um, because I've been very, very um, impressed, of course, with her Kitchen Gardens program over many years now and, and the amazing impact that's had. Um, I'd love to know how many of our participants tonight, um, I don't know if you can um, get a count on the comments or something uh, with this modern technology. Um, I'd love to know how many of you have engaged with uh, the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Gardens program. But um, what I can announce to you uh, tonight, folks, is that I've, I've, I've most recently had a wonderful conversation and Zoom conference with the dear, dear people running that foundation in lockdown in Melbourne. And um, they are absolutely delighted uh, that I'm so keen to engage with them. Um, they have wanted to include native foods uh, and plants in their garden programs more in, in recent years, but have not really had the right um, uh, know-how, I guess, um, or connections. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm extremely excited to, uh, very, um, very open to working with me uh, in my, my quest to see, um, well, uh, you know, my, my dream is to see, um, you know, every young uh, school kid in, in Australia in the next two to three years cooking with native ingredients at least once or twice. That would be a dream come true. Um, and so what I aim to do with Stephanie uh, and her foundation, uh, we're going to look at drafting a bit of an MOU up first. Uh, that's the idea and, and to start the dialogue. But um, to connect with, uh, I have connections with a few Indigenous growers and nurseries, and uh, I'm looking to get um, uh, more uh, uh, Indigenous plants uh, cultivated, hopefully under, under Indigenous brand, and that we can start to connect that through into the kitchen, uh, Stephanie's uh, foundation, and uh, weave some of the native plants into that program. Um, and then, of course, the recipes and the like. So um, I'm, I'm about to very soon start to um, engage in their online community a bit more, as I hope to now also, uh, if I can be hopefully invited into your online communities a bit, um, I'd love to be able to contribute and, and, and see what goes down, uh, see what you guys are wanting and needing and what's what's happening out on the ground there, it'd be marvellous. So um, that's that could also be, um, be very, very good. Um, so, uh, you know, little steps um, we're, we're starting um, and I think that um, the future really bodes well for a true Australian cuisine to ultimately emerge, um, with our, as I said, with our multicultural cooking styles, but with using a lot more native ingredients in amongst them. And that's always, uh, when, you know, if you, if you see my book, um, you know, the, the recipes, there's a lot of different cuisines and cultures in there where um, we, can, we can incorporate these amazing flavours. So, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do hope to um, contribute more recipes through the here website uh, and or the newsletter uh, on a regular basis and of course we'll keep uploading those uh, to the education uh, sector on the creative native website um really important too is we get your uh, feedback really i mean that's the last slide from this powerpoint um, um uh, very keen to get your feedback and uh, I guess um, hopefully we'll find a mechanism as well to, um, well, you may even just email me um, some of the recipes that you guys and your, your kids might come up with. Really interested in all that. Um, uh, another thing I'd love to do in the future, um, if I can get some support somewhere, is to start getting some, um, some uh, uh, little videos done up. I'd love to do that here with, um, uh, in, in Adelaide with perhaps some, some of the schools. Um, and especially get some young Indigenous students involved in, in the cooking and preparing of some of the native uh, ingredients in these simple recipes. So that could be another resource I'm hoping in the future. So lots of great ideas, uh, very time poor, but I'm very passionate about what I do and um, um, I hope we can uh, work alongside you guys um, in the years ahead. Um, 
to really develop this um, uh, resource and uh, help, I think, really influence uh, future generations to consider um, native foods, you know, regularly in their diets. So I guess that's that's my uh, my mission. Um, now, what else was I going to tell you? Um, I think. Um, I think I'm pretty well done. I sort of rushed through that a bit, uh, but I guess what that does do is allow us for the a few more um, minutes to um, to talk about um, you know what, what you guys need, what you guys think, um, maybe answer some questions. Um, open to all sorts of questions to the floor. Um, but um, is there anything that's come up on chat so far? Okay? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things, Andrew. Um, a couple of people have said they've started or they have some. Um, um, native food gardens, but sort of right. looking for some direction about what they sh could be planting. But because, of course, they're all over the country, is there any way you can suggest that people could go to see what's sort of endemic to their area or what would work well in their area to grow? Oh, certainly um, your local nurseries, your local uh, native nurseries, um, your uh, local land care groups. Um, yeah. Uh, that's the best advice at the moment. Um, but in saying that, you know, look, here in South Australia, the Riverland, um, you know, they're growing quite successfully bush tomatoes, which is a central arid desert plant. Um, uh, you know, they grow mangoes there and um, you know, stuff like that, you know, avocados in the Riverland, South Australia, which is, was never there. So, you know, there is possible uh, with the right conditions uh, and if you can provide small microclimates uh, in your certain areas in your garden. Um, but, but certainly, you know, if you're a school down in, in Tasmania, I wouldn't try bush tomatoes necessarily. Um, it's, it's about just understanding where the plant comes from and then trying if, if space and, and uh, resources permit, um, providing a microclimate for that particular plant um but yeah it is a tough one um but yeah hopefully that helps um but yeah certainly local land care groups um local nurseries the other, i mean the other, the other thing wisdom. I mean, I'm at VU and we've got a um, Indigenous community that works with us here. So there's often the communities around that can also advise you over what's what's possible in your area too. Um, the other the other question is uh, about your availability to to zoom into different schools, or are you planning to do some short videos um, demonstrating or talking about the products? Absolutely, I would love to do some some um, videos. Um, I'd like to try and enlist the help of one of the schools or colleges in Adelaide um, with, with some resources. Um, uh, I, I'm extremely busy um, running a business and uh, I, I'm actually quite time poor at the moment. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, I must say recovering from COVID has been quite disastrous financially for me, but uh, we're recovering. We're back to about 60, 70% of business because my business is, uh, was 98% food service and hospitality based. Um, so, you know, uh, but I'm really upbeat about what's happening. Um, and so um, I would love, I, I think I, I couldn't offer, uh, unless it was a very special occasion or something like that, um, and, and, and uh, um, uh, to, to, to zoom into certain schools, on, I'm not certainly not on a regular basis, but I, I would love to get together more resources uh, like videos, absolutely. That is on the agenda. Yep. I mean, one of the other things too, though, is is um, that if we could um, uh, maybe, um, uh, if we can do another uh, here webinar in the future, uh, maybe we could do it out of my kitchen and do a, a, incorporate a, a little demo here and there or something with some simple things would be good fun. Yep, that'd be good. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, folks, um, I would encourage you all to try and come to the HEAR National Conference next uh, September in Brisbane. Uh, I'm going to be there um, on, on, the, on the program, which I'm absolutely delighted and very proud. Um, so I'll be doing a, a Native Cuisine Masterclass. Um, um, I love doing these and, and, and maybe, um, guys, that's what we could do is, um, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I've done these all over the world as a guest chef. Uh, I've been so, so blessed with my uh, career to be invited all over the world cooking as a guest chef for Australian promotions and, and many, many countries. Um, 
and uh, particularly, you know, G'day USA and all those sorts of programs. Uh, and I've, hands down, every time I do it, a, 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 a fresh native ingredient tasting, people just go, wow, and, and they just are blown away, absolutely blown away. So I'm going to be doing that in Brisbane in, in September next year. Um, uh, depending on time, I could have as much as 30 or 40 fresh species um, of you to try and taste. Um, and um, it just blows people away uh, when they really do appreciate what it's like. Um, you know, uh, you can get great results um, out, out of dried things, but we all know, um, and, and frozen, but we all know um, ultimately you know, fresh is best um, uh, in, in most cases. So, yeah. It looks like those are from South Australia that have joined us tonight are going to be calling on your services quite easily um, yep. by the comments here. And there's a great response to the masterclass idea. So um, I, I think that's something that would be good for, for all of us if you can, can organise something like that, even pre-next yep. September, for us to have another session like this where you're, you're actually in your kitchen and, and show us some of those products and how to use them. Yeah, totally. Um, Another thing I'd like to share with you too is, is that um, um, I've recently just uh, formed a new uh, a new business called uh, Edible Reconciliation, and it's my first um, foray into a joint venture, a legitimate joint venture with an Aboriginal man. He's a marvellous bloke, good friend, uh, Dominic Smith. He's uh, a human man, I think is the, the right term, uh, but lives in the in Monash in South Australia. So he's a, a native food farmer. I've been trying to support him for a year, a few years as he's getting going. He's still learning to be a male nurse as a fallback position, but I'm saying, hey, you won't need that. Um, but um, he's working his guts out trying to establish um, uh, his native food farm there and um, he's extremely passionate about growing the Indigenous Grower Network. So we, we hope that um, Edible Reconciliation as a new business, we can be a shining light, um, hopefully a successful shining light in the years ahead to um, show what can be done uh, as we work together and work together with uh, Indigenous people and, and that legitimate joint ventures are a great way forward to for um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous to work together to develop and commercialise this amazing opportunity for Australia as a brand new food industry. And so I'm really excited about that. So um, look out for things with edible reconciliation in the future. Um, but um, I just wanted to, to, to mention that because uh, I'm just so passionate about in, engaging more and more with Indigenous groups Australia-wide, and uh, we do hope that we can build a huge Indigenous grower network to supply industry, manufacturing, exports, and all that for the years ahead. Yes, yeah, phenomenal I think, opportunities. I think that's an exciting opportunity I, um, because, as Andrew and I spoke about briefly, you know, some of these ingredients are very, very seasonal. So to have a network is critical to be able to maintain a consistent supply, not, not just for food service, but for us in teaching as well. Now, a few questions um, wanting you to talk about where do they get the kit from? How much does it cost? How do they get the resources? All the, all the nitty gritty behind the product that you've just demonstrated. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the, um, the, the kit is $49 plus uh, postage. So that varies a little where you, where you live, I guess, but um, I actually can't remember. I think it's uh, set fee on our website. I can't remember, but um, um, so uh, and then uh, you know we usually have those on hand. There's, there's no issue with supply at this point in time, and um, we uh, we can get them out usually in two to three days. It really varies. I, I've got to say, Australia Post uh, uh, and freight generally has been a bit of a nightmare throughout COVID. It's starting to come back. But, uh, you know, it can take longer than usual at the moment with Post. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, yeah, so that's that one. Um, yeah, um, things like um, uh, you know, even the wild basil. Um, there's some of the, these ingredients, uh, the wattle seed, uh, mostly that we have in the wattle seed is, is, is wild harvest, actually, by um, a network of Indigenous uh, ladies who gather in the Central Desert, Northern Territory. Um, so really proud to support them through, um, through collectors and coordinators there. <clears throat> but... Um, as I mentioned, with so many different uh, wattle seed species, there's significant plantations going down in the ground down in Victoria, New South Wales, etc., South Australia. So we'll see um, huge tonnages coming on into the markets in, in the years ahead. Um, the wild basil uh, we get currently is um, grown by um, uh, a community in uh, Catherine, Northern Territory. So they grow up to, for me, uh, at a marvellous um, 
uh, facility there, um, a food ladder, a hot house uh, that's uh, being run there. Food ladder is an amazing organisation we work with as well, trying to get more Indigenous communities um, growing, not just cucumbers, lettuces and tomatoes, but um, their traditional native foods of that region. Um, so why basil comes down from there. Um, the old man saltbush currently is, is a non-indigenous supplier, but there's uh, a number of um, people like Dominic um, and uh, others in York Peninsula, South Australia, and, other, and many around Australia that are getting into the saltbush um, and so on. So, um, yeah, um, it's really good um, to try and um, promote that more. Um, I, um, I, I certainly want to um, uh, get into other, other flavours, of course, um, other than just these five. The, um, the diversity and depth and breadth is just, it's, it's just extraordinary when you get into it. Sorry, with any more questions? Um, mate? No, I've just put up the link to the, the website. Um, yeah. The lesson yeah, so plan. Just all online. Um, folks, uh, one thing I do want to mention uh, that uh, um, Renee will get out a bit of a, a, a newsletter. And I'd like to um, offer, offer a little. Um, Incentive. Uh, if you needed to get a, a cookbook for your uh, for your school and an education kit, and if, if you took up that, that package, I'd, I'd be actually absolutely delighted for, for our attendees tonight um, to throw in a couple of extra little sachets of some extra spices, some some teas. I've got some lovely teas. Scented emu bush, bush which is an aromophila, <clears throat> and um, these these teas are I think the retail value is about worth about eight or nine dollars. I can't remember now. Um, also, we've got some lovely. Um, uh, uh, strawberry gum, tea plates, uh, incredible floral perfume, um, eucalyptus leaf, um, which um, it's called strawberry gum because um, when it, uh, it's in the growth stages, it gets the beautiful rose strawberry blush to the end of the end tips of the leaf. And so it's called strawberry gum, but it's got this amazing floral, fruity, pungent eucalyptus notes, and it's just stunning. In, um, you know, butterscotch sauce or sticky date puddings or um, um, all sorts of um, recipes, really. Uh, it's um, really, really good. What I'll do is I'll, I'll get um, Andrew to work with uh, with HEI admin and we'll send an email out to all the participants tonight with that with that link to that deal. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, we'll work that out. And um, I'll, I'll get my web my web guy to um, put on a get a special code and code yeah and uh, yep. send it out to everyone and to log on and where we go. The yeah. the other question has just come through is a bit of clarification um, about the lesson plans and the posters etc. Do they download them once they sign up or Correct. are they sent? Yeah, through? once once yep. you, you once you buy uh, buy the, the education kit, you, you get into the back end with the resources. Correct. Yeah, and that's the resources we have to do a lot more. It's just a start, really. That's good. Yep. Uh, that's it for questions at the moment. Yep. Unless anybody else has got anything, any, any, anything else. That's good. <clears throat> not seeing any croaky hands. voice. I'm um, not seeing any hands. We've got going. people from all over Australia here. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. And that's that's why uh, you know making sure that everybody understood the time zones, even for you, Andrew. Yeah. You know the half an hour difference for for yeah. lots of different people. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 So a lot of people saying they're looking forward to the presentation at the conference. So, you know, you know that I think that's going to be a, a a real clincher for people to be able to actually see the products and 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 work see you working with those products as well. Mm. It's a beautiful one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because for a yeah, lot I'm of very, people, I... very interested to turn in, in the kids' education. Um, in fact, um, my, the publisher of my book is. But already suggested we should maybe look uh, in the next year or so at a, at a kids um, native food cookbook. So that could be an interesting project. Yeah. And, and I think um, I know from the work that I've done is a lot of people are cautious about using a lot of these products. I think, you know, the, the sooner we can get people working with them and understanding them, um, the, the much better it is. And, you know, I think it's exciting working with the Stephanie Alexander program as well, because, uh, you know, I believe that the sooner we can get young people working with food, the, the more uh, interest they'll have and the more passion they'll have for it. So I think that's an exciting initiative as well. Absolutely. And um, oh, I love Stephanie to death. She's an amazing lady. I remember dining in her restaurant, oh gosh, back in the 80s, I think. And um, Now you're showing your age, Andrew. Sorry? Now you're showing your age. 
Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but um, I, I really uh, love to see her, her if, if we've uh, formed some lives and getting some traction by then, it would be great to see her come up to Brisbane as well. Um, she's getting pretty old though, dear Stephanie. Um, no, no, big time. Be nice. Um, well, there's, nowhere at the moment with lockdown. There's um, the question about are you able to freeze the herbs and spices? So even with the pouches you've got, if you know you're not going to use them, obviously they'll have a best before date. Do, yeah. Are they better off frozen if you know you're not going to use them for 12 months? What's your advice? I, I would I would suggest that um, you might not achieve too much. Um, I don't know. A lot of people say that um, freezing, you know, freeze coffee grinds and stuff like that to keep them fresher. But I've not, I've got no evidence of that to be honest. Um, yeah. I, I, you certainly must keep them away from sunlight. Uh, one of the other things, just to bear in mind too, is that because we're using a, a compostable, um, it's a it's a brown craft paper bag. It's paper on the outside and it's plastic lined, which is compostable. Um, so uh, bearing in mind that if it does get wet, you're going to damage the paper on the outside. So you know. Freezers obviously uh, trap some moisture, or if you, can get, if you get drips on them, and that we found that you've got to be careful there. So I would just say keep them, uh, you know, really well sealed. Um, even double seal them in, a, in another plastic um, snapbook bag if you think you're not going to get to them for a while. Would be my advice. Yeah. Um, a few people talking about their um, budgeting and the spending having been closed off for the year. So, but they're yep. excited about possibility for next year. Um, just just for a comment, a few people have joined us late. Just let everybody know that we are recording this tonight. So the idea is that, that we'll go through and do a bit of an edit to it and then we will be able to send that out to everybody as well. So uh, please be rest assured that you'll get this this um, this recording as well as the presentation as well. Yeah, good. Um, um, perhaps I can, I can ask them, um, uh, what, what, what are the top five... Um, Recipes that are cooked in, in home ec classes around Australia now, year seven and eight. And, and um, that will give me some uh, prompts to get stuck into those for you with recipes in the very near future. Uh, okay, I'll wait for that to come through on the uh, on the chat. Another question is, can you just outline a bit of, a bit about the book about the recipes that are in there? Sure. Are, are, they, are they structured like at the level for the education resource or are they for the home cook or are they for the, for the chef? Look, um, it's, it's absolutely primarily um, uh, targeted at, at the home cook. Uh, as, has been for, as has been for many, many years, it's my, my passion about um, trying to help evolve a true Australian cuisine, you know. And so the, the recipes are definitely targeted to the home cook. There's a couple of technical aspects in, in, a, in, in a few of them, but really um, I think we've done pretty well in terms of the description and the way we write the recipe. Uh, I'm certainly getting good raps on that from, from people um, uh, who are commenting about the book. Um, the other thing that um, uh, I had one journalist from the Australian comment about is that um, he, he felt it was a bit like the... Um, the Australian version of the Stephanie Alexander cook, Cook's Companion. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a huge wrap because um, that's a magnificent uh, compendium. Um, uh, and we're certainly nowhere near as good as that or big as that, I don't think, but we do have a lot more colour in and, um, and that, and that book, of course, um, Stephanie's book. But, um, yeah, there are some, some lovely tables. We've done tables on um, and seasonal use and stuff like that and, um, and um yeah, different, different hints and tips. But um, we do things like um, a couple of recipes in there. We're using sous vide cooking, but uh, really, really, um, it's, it's more about the basics. Yeah. And, uh, nothing's extraordinarily difficult. Okay. Response to your question about what are they cooking in the, the food tech classrooms? You got your pen and paper ready? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's quite diverse, as you can imagine. You know, we've got stir fry hamburgers. Fried rice, wattle seed meringues, scones, scones, yeah. um, quiche frittata. Another group here did kangaroo meatballs. Nice. Anzac biscuits, muffins, risotto, um, some basic baking, so muffins, scones, and biscuits, which is always goes down yeah. well. Lemon yeah. myrtle shortbreads, yum. Um, yeah. Wraps of all varieties. 
you know, they're looking for short, quick meals with lots of veggies. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and um, cafe style food because a few a few places have their own little cafes and coffee shop things, so things that can be easily fit into that sort of that area there. Oh, that's great feedback. Oh my God, Some of that is... certainly is is along the lines of what I've I was expecting. That's great. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll cut this out and send it to you. I'll keep this and send this to you because there's some really interesting ideas that people are using, and quite a lot of them using indigenous uh, flavors in there. So I think it'd be good for you to see that. So I'll, yeah. I'll send this through to you. Oh, good. Has yeah. anyone had any uh, problem uh, working with a native ingredient that they have a question about? You know, did they did they stuff up a recipe or something? Because I stuffed up plenty when I started. I can tell you. Still do. Come on, be honest. We all do. Yeah. <laughs> Like I remember um, back in the uh, um, late 80s, the first time I made um, a, a waddle seed, um, I tried to do a waddle seed cream caramel. And um, of course, the enzymes in the waddle seed just um, s split the, uh, the caramel, I think it was, if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah, I, I quickly learned I had to make a, a simple essence out of water, sugar, and wattle seed first yeah. to, to cook yeah. that and then stabilize the wattle seed and then put it into my cream caramel. Yeah. Flavor. A couple of questions coming here, which is about how much, you know, getting the quantities right is, is uh, always a challenge, particularly when yeah. it's a new ingredient. Um, you know, how much do you need? And, and those, like the things you talked about, with soaking your wattle seeds and knowing how to prepare them prior. I think, yeah. I think they're the things that um, can often be different about these ingredients that we, we probably uh, use differently spice wise with traditional spices. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's all, um, yeah, good questions. And uh, it's all part of the learning curve. Um, yeah. And what can you do with quandongs? Uh, sorry. <laughs> what can you do with quandongs beside making jam? <laughs> oh, um, it, it makes a marvelous um, savory glaze with, um, with kangaroo or with, with yep. venison or any you know, duck, lamb, anything like that, really. Um, so you, uh, I love to hydrate or rehydrate the, the quangongs with um, a bit of orange juice and water or even full on orange juice and just a hint of sugar to balance the acid, do that to taste. It just adds a lovely depth of flavor um, to the quangong, but it's not essential. And then um, uh, once the quangongs are reconstituted in this, like a, like a, a compote, then you add that to a glaze um, or, or a nice gravy. Um, and if you really want to en enrich um, uh, a gravy first, say, if you want to do it with a nice um, steak, uh, you can obviously, if, you, if you're using a um, you know, commercial stock or you're not making your own stocks, you can reduce that right down, but um, also do a, a reduction of port wine uh, and, and, a, and a little hint of red wine vinegar to get a lovely sweet sour reduction. That was... Um, uh, how I first developed actually my first, one of my um, signature dishes in the Red Oaker Years uh, restaurant uh, back in 90. Well, I, I first developed that dish in 85 um, at uh, Mount Lofty House, but it became a signature dish. So it was the first time I, I combined two native foods with um, using macadamias and quangong in the same dish, but um, the, um, and kangaroo, sorry. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's based on the classic sauce poivre, which is the French hunting or game sauce which involves a sweet uh, uh, you know, red currant vinegar, red currant je jelly and red wine vinegar, sorry, reduction to get a last, a nice uh, you know, sweet sour reduction and very intense. And then you add that to your, your gravy or jus. And that's where I had the quangdong reduction in there as well. And just put the quangdong uh, pieces through at the end just to warm them through. And it's a, a marvelous, intense, sweet sour reduction, syrupy glaze to go wonderful with duck and game meats and so on. Kangaroo meatballs even. Yeah, that's right. The, the other one that's come up, which is one that, that I'm interested in as well, is the cinnamon myrtle. What can you yeah, tell cinnamon us about myrtle. That? Yeah. Um, one of a number of the myrtles. Um, but um, I've been disappointed in it. Um, I, um, I've i never found a good one yet. I, I've, I've heard of people that have a secret tree somewhere that's quite a nice flavour, but it is a very, very subtle cinnamon nutmeggy type flavour. And uh, I find it very difficult to extract anything meaningful out of it, I'll be blunt. So, um, but it doesn't matter, there's you know, 10,000 other edible native species around. So um, there's plenty to choose from, but I'm, I'm looking forward to someone finding a brilliant 
species, you know, a rare one in the wild that's got some decent flavor. Um, the other thing, interesting thing with myrtles, uh, you need to be aware is that um, uh, there's myrtle rust disease, uh, which uh, affects the myrtaceae family uh, of plants. It's all down uh, Queensland, New South Wales, and into northern Victoria, I understand. Um, and that prohibits anyone sending um, the Myrtisay family, which even includes eucalypts, um, into South Australia um, and the West Australia. So I, I have to, I can't bring in um, lemon myrtle and any myrtle or cinnamon myrtle where the big, bigger producers are on the East Coast. I can't bring that into South Australia. So I've only got a smaller resource in South Australia, small growers here. That's an interesting one. People need to be aware of that when they're moving native ingredients around the country, that there are biosecurity restrictions on some things. Mm. Another question, you know, I, I suppose it begs a question. I suppose that I'm always thinking about is when do you add these flavours to your dishes? I mean, traditionally you add spices at the beginning and you add herbs at the end. Is that the same for all of these products, or is there some variation on that? Uh, I say a bit of both. So yeah. a really good point. Um, uh, a really good point. Um, let's go to pepper leaf first. So pepper leaf, um, there's a compound in, in the leaf and the fruit, which is known as pepper berry, which uh, when uh, the black fruit, once it uh, forms after flower uh, in, in uh, summer, February, March is pepper berry harvest time. Um, so um, we're nearly out of whole pepper berry, by the way, because it was a very poor harvest with um, yeah. very poor rains in Tassie this last summer. Um, so uh, there's compound, a compound in the pepper um, shrub, uh, which is called polygodile, and it's um, a compound which denatures with, with uh, a little bit of cooking heat. So the heat um, is quite hot and it builds slowly on the palate. Um, with, when you eat the raw um, pepper leaf uh, fresh or chew on the dried ground leaf, you get quite a nice spicy kick out of it. But unlike chilli, it, it, um, it doesn't stay in your palate for a long time. It dissipates reasonably quickly, a lot quicker than chilli. So that's a bonus. Um, so when I'm doing a native pepper leaf dish, um, especially if I'm um, picking off a few fresh fronds from, from the, my shrub in the patio, um, I'll, I'll put in some pepper leaf at the start of a dish to get some base flavour, but you lose the heat because you're cooking. You might be simmering a, a lamb shank with pepper leaf and olives and a red wine reduction um, for four hours or something. Um, so if I'm looking for the pepper leaf kick, I'll do either of two things, just sprinkle over some dry ground at the end, like you would grind black pepper on, uh, or I, I pound up um, some fresh leaf in with olive oil and water and pestle or blitz it with a um, you know, thermomix mix or whatever um, to let it get a, a fresh pepper sambal. In fact, uh, I like to have that as a, as a uh, and season reasonably with salt as a in, in the fridge. So it's a bit like having chili oil in your fridge, or sorry, in your cupboard. You know, the Asians have a nice chili oil, have a native pepper leaf, um, like a little salsa or a sambal, where it's fresh blitzed uh, pepper leaf with olive oil and a bit of salt, and you can just drizzle that over. So, and it's not cooked; it's just a cold preparation, so it doesn't last forever. And you just drizzle that over as a spice paste in a way, or a thin drizzle. It's really nice. The question with the, is pepper leaf and mountain pepper the same thing? Correct. Yeah, they're all related. Um, as you say, they've got a good kick and um, I often just put the dry pepper leaves in my pepper grinder as well because they uh, they give a good kick as well. Mm, yeah. With the old man's salt, which, um, it's basically a, a dry, salty, sort of herbaceous vegetable type flavour, uh, mildly salty, not, not too salty. Um, really... Um, that's just as, as a nice sort of salty vegetable nutty type flavour. It does, when you toast up the saltbush leaves, you can even just really gently toss them in a frying pan like um, some people might brown pine nuts, you know, just gently sautéing it and keeping it moving without stopping to toast it. Or in a, in a cool oven, say 160 degrees for um, a convection oven for eight to 10 minutes to get a lovely golden brown toast, you just increase that nuttiness in the saltbush leaf. That's another addition you can... <clears throat> do for more savoury. I just put up online recently a, 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 a roast cauliflower pieces with a salt bush and crumb, palms and crust. We just put that one up online recently. That's quite lovely. And um, that's when um, you get some nice caramelising of the salt bush leaves and palms along the cauliflower as a lovely roast veggie side dish. With the wattle seed, um, 
uh, in the kits, the roast ground seed, as I said, so it's really fine on medium ground. So you do need to, um, it's not essential, but it's, it's, uh, it's probably advisable where you want to steep the wattle seed in a little bit of boiling water or, or gently simmer it very briefly to let it uh, really hydrate and dry out all those flavours. Um, another interesting thing to note is that um, for 35 or so years in the, in the native food industry, in the commercial food industry, wattle seed has been traded. It's only been the one species, which is Acacia victoria, really, uh, which is the elegant or prickly wattle. Um, and that's because it's been uh, quite readily available, very prolific in the, in the outback in South Australia and, and New South, uh, New South Wales, Western New South Wales and Queensland as well, I believe, and a bit in Northern Territory. But um, it's a, a very high yielder and so it's been easy to get. But um, uh, mostly it's often been really darkly roasted or we'll get this really strong uh, coffee, bitter caramel notes, um, which um, uh, is great if you're doing an ice cream or a, a really really um, uh, strong flavoured dessert. But um, I personally love to, and I only roast my wattle seed to about a medium level, light to medium, because I love the more uh, nutty um, grain type characters you get when it's not taken quite so far. But if you try my wattle seed and find it quite different to what you've experienced in the past, um, really easy, spread it out on a um, tray. Again, 170, 80 degrees, uh, two, three, four minutes, in a convection oven, you'll see it start to smoke and darken. Um, you, you're just toasting it a bit more. You can easily do that if you want a darker, stronger, um, more coffee, chicory-like character to your wattle seed. So if you're looking for more grainy, nutty sort of characters, um, that's why I leave it as a light to medium roast. All right, well, I'm conscious of time. We're bang on six o'clock, so um, I think we've done very well. So thank you, Andrew. Mm. Um, I, um, I'll make sure that we, we um, get that information from you about the, the offer that you've made for some teasers, some extra products for us. Yeah, we totally. To sign up. Well, look after you guys, and um, I would love to hear from you at some stage um, about your journey and uh, how we can help improve, educate our kids. Yep. And uh, I, we all look forward to seeing you in Queensland next year. Yes. And I'd be happy to do another webinar another time if I'm invited. I dare say you will get a good turn up again because, as I say, this was the biggest turn up we've had for any of ours now. So. Well, I'm delighted and thank you so much for your time. And um, I think as a, as a team, we can all work together to help truly advance Australian Fair. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And don't forget, if you need a certificate for tonight, please email heia at heia.com.au and see you with the next of our okay. workshops. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Bye.